December 2012. The White House is warning the British government against leaving the European Union. January 2013. President. The US values a strong UK in a strong European Union. With respect, Mr. President, do you know what you are asking? My country, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, is about to lose its sovereignty. It's now controlled not by an occupying army, but by an undemocratic bureaucracy established to eliminate independent European nation states. Incredible as it may sound, over the past half century, British politicians have given away control of Britain to a collection of unelected, unaccountable, and in large part unknown foreign bureaucrats who meet in secret and create laws which must be obeyed. Westminster, the mother of parliaments, is increasingly meaningless. Almost all power has been drained away to be replaced by a Brussels-based oligarchy. The British people are now within a heartbeat of losing their freedom, their way of life, their national identity, their currency, their right to self-government and their nation. The very fabric of Britain is being dismembered, its uniqueness destroyed. And all this has happened without either the consent or the knowledge of the people themselves. You don't believe me? Watch and discover how democratic Britain has been deconstructed. The 60s and 70s were dynamic decades for Britain as the country emerged from the austere shadow of the post-war years. There was an energetic optimism in the land, a sense that anything was possible. But there was also discontent, a winter of discontent in the early 1970s as trade unions flexed their muscles and took on the government, resulting in demonstrations, strikes, power cuts and a three-day working week. Britain was described as the sick man of Europe. Something had to be done. Very few, however, were aware of what was being planned. In 1957, six continental countries, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Luxembourg and the Netherlands, signed the Treaty of Rome and agreed to form the European Economic Community, erroneously referred to in Britain as the common market. Government papers of the time, now released, show that even as early as the late 50s, Prime Minister Macmillan and his colleagues knew the true nature of this common market and that it was designed to create a federal European state based on not just economic union, but also political union. The British Foreign Office had been briefed as early as 1957 that the aim of the six signatories was to achieve tighter European integration through the creation of European institutions with supranational powers beginning in the economic field. In 1960, the head of the UK delegation to the EU Commission in Brussels reported that the aim of the community was not merely harmonization, but the unification of policies in every field of the economic union. And then this telling statement that this was not just pie in the sky needed to be made clear to the politicians. But British politicians already knew. They secretly decided that Britain must be part of this venture, although its true nature was to be kept from the British people and presented as nothing more than a trading arrangement. And so commenced a half century of lies and deception during which British politicians of all three major political parties conspired with civil servants and the media to distract and deceive the public whilst they secretly dismantled the nation that is Britain. The long nightmare had begun. In 1969, the Prime Minister of Luxembourg, Pierre Werner, 
produced a report detailing how the common market would eventually evolve into a full economic and monetary union. Heath was informed by his Minister for Europe, Con O'Neill, that the Werner Plan could lead to the ultimate creation of a European federal state with a single currency and all the basic instruments of national economic management handed over to federal authorities. O'Neill added that such a union would involve a massive loss of national sovereignty, which would ultimately leave member states with somewhat less power than the autonomy enjoyed by the states of the USA. Geoffrey Rippon, the minister in charge of British negotiations, met Werner and amazingly told him that the report well stated our common objective. Heath and his ministers had no objection to the political union Werner was proposing. In fact, they were all for it, but they knew that it would find little, if any, support from the British people. To overcome this problem, they resolved that the less about Britain's loss of sovereignty that came out into the open, the better. This then was the plan. From now on, nothing would be said that would reveal the inexorable loss of British sovereignty. The benefits of the common market would be talked up while obfuscation at best and deceit at worst would be deployed to cover up the disadvantages of membership. Civil servants and politicians were committed to concealing from the British people the true cost, both financial and political, of membership of the European Economic Community. During 1970, Heath organised what was to be Britain's successful application to join the European Economic Community. By this time, Heath and his colleagues were well versed in pretending that the EEC was something it was not. In a white paper to Parliament and repeated on page 12 of his pamphlet, The Historic Decision, Heath declares, there is no question of Britain losing essential national sovereignty. The word essential in that statement provides Heath with room to justify what he had said. Nevertheless, he was deliberately or otherwise giving a totally false impression that the sovereignty of Britain was not going to be affected by membership of the community, all the while knowing that it was. It's difficult even after 40 years to come to terms with the misleading dishonesty of that statement, especially when one considers the content of the 1971 Foreign and Commonwealth Office document FCO 30-1048. This briefing document for ministers set out in great detail the true nature of what was about to take place. Repeatedly throughout its tightly typed 11 pages, this document describes the total loss of sovereignty that was about to happen to Britain. Here are just a few examples. The loss of external sovereignty will increase as the community develops. Community law is required to take precedence over domestic law. If a community law conflicts with a statute, it is the statute which has to give way. Essential aspects of sovereignty, both internal and external, would indeed increasingly be transferred to the community itself. By the end of the century, with effective defense and political harmonization, the erosion of the international role of the member states will be almost complete. Despite these and countless other dire warnings contained in 1048, Heath, in a 1973 television broadcast, made a public statement that was deeply disingenuous. There are some in this country who fear that in going into Europe we shall in some way sacrifice independence and sovereignty. These fears, I need hardly say, are completely unjustified. 1048 was the centerpiece of this grand deception, as well as describing Britain's surrender of sovereignty and the end of its democratic way of life. It also contained an explicit instruction to deceive the British public, which senior politicians from the major political parties over the past four decades have obeyed to the letter. They still do today. It reads as follows. After entry, 
there would be a major responsibility on Her Majesty's government and on all political parties not to exacerbate public concern by attributing unpopular measures or unfavorable economic developments to the remote and unmanageable workings of the community. In other words, politicians were being instructed not to tell the public about the new form of government that was being imposed upon them, but to pretend that the Houses of Parliament at Westminster were still the source of new laws. Heath and others were safe in their treachery as document 1048 was suppressed for the next 30 years. On the 1st of January 1973, with the slimmest of parliamentary majorities, but without directly consulting the British people, Heath took Britain into what was described as a trading agreement with Europe, but was in reality membership of a federal states of Europe. In 1975, a new Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, held a referendum on whether Britain should remain in the common market. Following in Heath's footsteps, Wilson produced a pamphlet entitled Britain's New Deal in Europe. This contained the usual mixture of waffle and lies. There is no hint of the loss of sovereignty that Britain would suffer. At one point, Wilson writes that Britain and the other members did not wish to weaken their national parliaments. This was a lie. He falsely stated that Britain could always use its veto to prevent damaging EU legislation impacting on Britain, all the time knowing that part of the price of membership was relinquishing that self-same veto. Finally, he intimated that the threat of economic and monetary union had been removed, when of course it hadn't. With such strong assurances about membership and with UK inflation soaring to alarmingly high levels, it was little wonder that the British people voted two to one to remain in the common market, little realising that they had been misled into giving their political leaders the green light to engage in the biggest betrayal of Britain's sovereignty in British history. From 1973 and for the next 40 years, six treaties sucked the life out of Britain, whilst British politicians assured the public that it wasn't happening. This is how it was done. From the 1st of January 1973, the date it joined the common market, Britain became subject to the Treaty of Rome. As well as secretly agreeing to an increasing loss of national sovereignty, British politicians relinquished control to Brussels of fishing under the common fisheries policy and farming under the common agricultural policy. In the years that followed, both industries suffered greatly. Farming of whatever type withered, with farmers being encouraged to diversify, in reality, turning their backs on the production of food and the husbandry of the land. Today, Britain is no longer self-sufficient in food. Should food cease to be imported for whatever reason, the country is just a handful of days away from the beginnings of famine conditions. For fishing, it was to be even worse. Despite being told that the common fisheries policy would be seriously damaging, Heath gave away British fishing grounds secretly, declaring that the fishermen and their communities were expendable. Sure enough, EU membership was to inflict complete decimation on the British fishing industry and the wholesale destruction of a way of life. Livelihoods were further devastated by the draconian imposition of the EU quota system, which resulted in more fish being thrown back into the sea dead than were being landed. In 1986, Margaret Thatcher was the Prime Minister. She signed the nation up to the Single European Act, the Second Treaty. Amongst many other provisions, the Thatcher government agreed to qualified majority voting in the Council of Ministers. This meant that increasingly there were areas of governance where Britain could no longer use the national veto to prevent damaging legislation being imposed. Wilson's duplicity of 13 years previously was seen for the treachery it was. Today, there are less than a handful of areas where the veto can be used. Britain is now virtually governed by people it neither votes for nor even knows. A huge swathe of sovereignty was handed away in 1992 with the Maastricht Treaty, 
which was agreed to by Prime Minister John Major. Pretty citizens, without knowing it or being consulted, became European citizens. Control of all transport systems, road, rail, air and sea, was handed to Brussels. The single currency, the euro, was introduced, and although Britain had an opt-out and kept the pound sterling, Major meekly agreed to giving Brussels a considerable measure of control over Britain's economic policy. The concept of a European Defence Force, another name for an army, was accepted with this treaty. Perhaps most damaging was the replacing of the centuries-old structure of British counties by 12 EU governmental regions, directly answerable to Brussels and completely bypassing Parliament at Westminster. It's almost beyond belief to realise that whilst all this was taking place, the British people were being kept in the dark. But they were, and more changes were to come. By 1997, Prime Minister Tony Blair was an ardent Euro Federalist. In Amsterdam, Blair signed the Fourth Treaty and readily agreed to EU competition rules, which, amongst other things, virtually destroyed the British Postal Service and the intricate network of post offices, which was, for so many, the centre of village life in Britain. It also saw the introduction of Europol, an EU-wide police force. In 2001, the Treaty of Nice saw another huge raft of concessions again signed up to by Tony Blair. Britain's much admired and much copied criminal justice system now came under attack with the proposed introduction of the EU system of justice known as Corpus Juris. Amongst a number of changes, the right to jury trial is to be eliminated, as is the safeguard of habeas corpus. Perhaps one of the most contentious issues to arise from EU involvement in the criminal justice system has been the introduction of the European arrest warrant. This warrant requires no evidence other than to identify the person on the warrant. The judge or magistrate then has no option but to sign the warrant and the suspect can be immediately transported to a country where the safeguards of the British system of justice do not apply. The Lisbon Treaty in 2007, the latest power grab by Brussels, was agreed to and signed by Prime Minister Gordon Brown. As well as pulling together most of the elements of the five preceding treaties, Lisbon saw a further surrender of sovereignty as this treaty conferred on the European Union the status of legal personality, making it a sovereign state in its own right and no longer a collection of sovereign nation states. This sixth treaty requires the 27 nation states to support the European Union in whatever venture it undertakes, to reinforce the concept of European citizenship rather than national nation state citizenship, and to support the euro as the currency of the Union. In addition, the treaty contains a flexibility clause, which allows the EU to grant itself the power to do virtually anything it wants to do, even though if such power does not exist. This makes the Lisbon Treaty self-amending, requiring no approval from the member states for the EU to take further powers to itself. Finally, a third of the treaty consisted of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, as well as trampling all over the British Constitution, the Charter significantly changed the concept of human rights in Britain, where a citizen can do anything unless the law forbids. Under the EU Charter, the citizen can do nothing unless the EU permits. These, then, are the six treaties by which control of Britain has been handed to an undemocratic, unaccountable, unelected elite. So well have British politicians deceived the people of Britain that even now a significant majority is blissfully unaware of what has happened to them. But the veil of ignorance is being increasingly pulled back. Having stripped 27 national governments, including Britain, of virtually all power, the EU has set about controlling us. This is done simply by legislating on almost every aspect of our lives, as well as regulating industry and commerce. As a result, a huge library of laws, 
directives and regulations has built up, all of which must be complied with. Against such impositions, we have no protection from our own political representatives. For too long, they have played their pretend game, all the while giving away our freedom so that now they, like us, are mere observers, watching the approach of the end game. The European Union is undemocratic. It takes little or no notice of the wishes of the peoples of Europe. Its non-acceptance of the results of referenda illustrates this point well. In June 2001, in a national referendum, the Irish people rejected the Treaty of Nice. According to EU rules, this should have meant the abandonment of the treaty. However, the EU simply refused to accept this clear rejection and ordered a second Irish referendum in October 2002. On this occasion, the treaty was accepted. This yes-no attitude to referendum results has been repeated many times. In 2005, the French and Dutch peoples rejected the proposed EU constitution by overwhelming majorities. Six countries, including Britain, were then due to hold referenda on the constitution, but were told that in view of the French and Dutch results, there was no need, as the constitution was dead in the water, kicked into the long grass, and would not reappear. In 2007, the Lisbon Treaty surfaced. Despite it being virtually word for word identical to the rejected EU constitution, British politicians brazenly declared that it was not, and therefore did not require a British referendum. Only Ireland was allowed to hold a referendum. In June 2008, the Irish people rejected the treaty. According to the now well-practiced European approach, Ireland was invited to rerun their referendum. In October 2008, the Irish people voted a second time, and as last time, they accepted the treaty and Brussels got the answer it wanted. The attitude of the EU to referenda is very simple. Keep voting until you provide the answers we want. There is a complete lack of democratic accountability in virtually everything the EU does, not least the activity in the European Parliament, as these simple comparisons show. In the Westminster parliamentary model, the differing political parties produce election manifestos for the public, setting out the policies they will pursue if elected to office. In the EU model, no such manifestos exist, as MEPs do not create legislation. That is the role of the appointed, note not elected, commission. At the opening of Parliament in Britain, there is the Queen's speech outlining forthcoming legislation. In Brussels, no such advanced notice is given. In Britain, there is a loyal opposition which opposes, examines and challenges the government. No such opposition exists in Brussels as the EU is a one-party federal state. In Westminster, legislation is created, formed and approved by MPs. In the EU model, it is the unelected, self-appointed commission which creates and formulates legislation. Members of Parliament in Britain are voted into and indeed out of office by the electorate. In the EU Parliament, although the MEPs are voted into office, the real decision makers, the 27 members of the EU Commission, are appointed into office and cannot be dismissed by the electorate. Under the British Constitution, no Parliament may bind its successor. All EU treaties and subsequent legislation are established in perpetuity. In order to encourage the 27 EU countries to integrate and harmonise, the euro currency was introduced on the 1st of January 1999, with the intention that it would bring about economic and monetary union. 17 countries adopted the new currency, Britain did not. The principle behind the currency is that it should have a fixed value throughout the 17 eurozone countries, underpinned by a one-size-fits-all economic policy. This has proved to be difficult to sustain, and vast amounts of money, known as bailouts, have had to be transferred to a number of states in order to sustain the currency. In particular, Ireland, Greece, Portugal and Cyprus. Italy and Spain too are experiencing severe economic problems with the currency. 
France and the Netherlands similarly are finding Euro membership difficult. The only country to prosper in the Eurozone is Germany. Countries which fail to comply with the economic decisions of the Eurozone leaders are ruthlessly dealt with. Both Greece and Italy questioned the imposition of austere economic packages. Within days and without the consent of the people, both countries had to suffer Brussels installing technocratic governments. Puppet governments put in place to reinforce EU economic policies. Similarly, a recent bailout package included the wholesale seizure of money from private bank accounts in Cyprus. This was done without a vote in the Cyprus parliament or the involvement of the Cypriot people. The EU uses economic crises to further extend its power. To overcome these crises, the EU takes more sovereignty from the member states. Total economic and political control of the member states is the objective. So much for democracy. Although Britain is not a member of the Eurozone, it's required to assist in the costly bailouts. Britain remains a member of the European Union and is a signatory to the Lisbon Treaty, which declares that the currency of the Union is the Euro. Sometime in the future, Britain's Euro membership looks a distinct probability, and with it will go the last vestiges of British sovereignty. The cost to Britain of 40 years EU membership has been enormous. For virtually the whole of that time, Britain has had a trade deficit with the EU, whilst with the rest of the world, it has run a surplus. All three main political parties have steadfastly refused to produce a cost-benefit analysis of Britain's EU membership. However, informed research estimates it costs Britain between 120 and 140 billion pounds per year. Included in that figure is Britain's gross contribution to the EU budget, currently amounting to over 50 million pounds every day. Today, the trading agreement we were told we were signed up to back in the 1970s has become a federal state with a parliament, an executive, the commission, a civil service, a federal police force, a federal prosecutor, a criminal justice system, a currency, a supreme court, a flag, an anthem, a president, lawmaking powers, a fledgling armed force, a diplomatic agency. In fact, all the trappings of a sovereign state. The architects of this project are now almost within touching distance of achieving their goal. The federal states of Europe, controlled by a centralized government, where the sovereign countries of Europe, including Great Britain, cease to exist, becoming merely regions or provinces of the greater Europe. The fact that their economic policies are bringing about recession, unemployment, poverty, despair, and now social unrest matters not one jot to these governments. For the unelected bureaucrats in Brussels, the Commission, the project is everything. Hastened by the EU policy of unencumbered movement of people throughout the European Union, in reality, uncontrolled immigration, nation states such as Britain are disappearing. This is ethnic engineering at full tilt. Staring us in the face is a new Soviet Union, and we want no part of it. The British people will never give up their freedom, not even for you, Mr. President. Listen to what a victim of the previous Soviet Union has to say. For many years, Vladimir Bukovsky was a leading member of a dissident group exposing Soviet human rights violations. He spent 12 years as a political prisoner in prisons, labor, and work camps. Released in 1976, he came to the West where in 2001, he received the Truman Reagan Medal of Freedom. Let his words be the last words. In the Soviet Union, they told us we needed a federal state to avoid war. In the European Union, they are telling you exactly the same thing. 
In short, the same ideology underpins both systems. The EU is an old Soviet model presented in Western guise. But again, like the Soviet Union, the European Union has within itself the seeds of its own demise. Unfortunately, when it collapses, and it will, it will leave immense destruction behind and we will be left with huge economic and ethnic problems. The old Soviet system was incapable of reform, so is the European Union, but there is an alternative to being ruled by those two dozen self-appointed officials in Brussels. It is called independence. You don't have to accept what they have planned for you. After all, you have never been asked if you wanted to join. I have lived in your future, and it didn't work.